Welcome everyone. I'm Charles Dodd White with the English Department at Pellissippi State Community College, and I'm proud to be able to, to present the final reading of this year's James AG online reading series, Jim Minnick. Jim will be talking about the power of time in writing and how that can change the way that we view the world. I do hope you enjoy it, and I hope you share it with as many people as possible. I look forward to bringing the series back next year as well. Thank you. My name is Jim Minnick, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. And thanks to Charles Dodd White and the Pellissippi Community College for hosting this event. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, I'm going to give you a craft talk and then a reading after that. And um, the craft talk is, is based on a secret power that uh, writers have. And we're, we're playing, we're focusing with time here. We're focusing on time. And so this, think of all the units of time that we use and then throw them out. And I want you to think about time in a different manner. And to help you with that, I'm gonna ask you to do a little exercise. Uh, it should be fun and, and hopefully not too painful. Um, and to make this exercise work, I have to give you four special gifts. Um, <clears throat> the first is that you are a New York Times bestselling author and your newest book has just come out, number one. The second gift is that you can become invisible. You have an invisibility blanket. And then the th the third gift is uh, you can shrink and you can fly. That's your fourth gift, it's like uh, Tinkerbell, right? So let's pretend we're riding a subway. Now let's make it a train. We have windows that way. And you notice a few seats ahead of you that this person is reading your new book and you're fascinated by it, and you're thrilled that she is doing that. And I want you to use your special powers now. So imagine yourself shrinking, flying, and becoming invisible. And I want you to fly to her book. So she is, she's reading a hardcover book, and I want you to fly and sit right on the, um, edge, top edge of, of her book facing her. And I want you to watch her. And I want you to think about time and what happens to time while she reads your brand new book. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do that. So just put yourself, you're sitting, you don't need to worry about the train stops. You got to be both on this journey for a long while. Uh, you don't need to worry about her turning pages. She, you know, you, you, your invisibility won't, the pages go right through you. Um, so you just watch her face and we'll do 30 seconds starting now. All right, so if this were a interactive session, uh, we could talk about what you observed. I wish we could, we can't. So I'm going to just kind of guess. I would guess that you observed her uh, maybe scratching her ear. Uh, hopefully she didn't yawn. Hopefully she didn't look out the window. Uh, hopefully she was so absorbed she didn't get this distracted at all, all right? Your book is that good. Um, I'm guessing you might have observed her eyes and how they moved across the page. And thinking about time, I hope you thought and observed her breath. How did she breathe when she was reading your book? 
and maybe at the slow parts her breathing was normal, maybe at the fast parts it picked up. And that is the gift. We writers share, or we, we writers usually don't realize, uh, but we have the ability to manipulate a person's breath, a reader's breath with our words. So think about that. How do we do that? That's the big question and how and there are many, many ways we can manipulate time. But if you think about the basic, basic unit of time as being a person's breath, which is the basic unit of time, um, then your words and how you put them in order will help you help the reader experience your work even better. So, like I said, there's many, many ways of, of talking about time. And to get at that, um, I'm going to focus on just the micro. There's macro, there's large ways of thinking about time, uh, like the length of a, a story and so forth. Um, but this, this, for ease, let's focus on the micro the smaller ways of using time and probably the most powerful and the most common uh, is punctuation and what is the most powerful form of punctuation what is uh in a yeah, that's probably contest could be contested but we'll just go with it what's the most powerful con punctuation the period um if you have studied music at all you know you know full breath is <clears throat> where you take a full breath to, to gas up for your next round of notes um and a period does that a period is a full stop and so when you are writing along you know you want that full stop um to be powerful to be well used and so kind of what's the opposite of that is comma right that's like a half breath and so as you are you know some readers some writers don't use commas at all they um are playing with language so to that effect to see if they can get away with the order of the words making the reader breathe or take half breaths where needed so um the comma is like a hot half breath the period's a full breath and then in between, and here's your bad English teacher joke. Um, what happens when mama comma and papa period have a baby? They have Sam the semicolon. So yes, the semicolon is halfway between uh, the, in the breathing realm um, and also kind of in the, the content realm as far as, you know, these two clauses, phrases are linked um, by the semicolon, uh, whereas a period would separate them much more definitely and a comma would link them much more strongly. So it's, it's in between. So to think a little bit more about punctuation and time, I want to share with you uh, an example. Uh, uh, this is going to be a, a nonfiction, very short piece by David Huddle, who is a, a great writer. Um, from the Virginia mountains. And uh, this <clears throat> story is called Story Boy. It's an essay actually called Story Boy. And it was published in Brevity Magazine, which is a, a terrific online magazine of short nonfiction. And I'm just gonna read the first five or six sentences um, just to have, so we have an example of, of thinking about time. So. Story Boy. This is sixth grade. We're in that dim little hallway outside the closet sized room where they sell popsicles during recess. The big boys are teasing me, but it's friendly bullying that I don't mind. They're not asking me leading questions. They just want to get me started. Next paragraph. Okay. I'm 11 years old, very hormonal, both smart and an ignorant, full of myself, crazy for attention and admiration. It's 1953. We've just gotten TV at our house, two channels, and I've watched George Goebel, 
I've seen Jerry Lewis movies. And also my grandfather is a loquacious man who loves talking about the old characters in town. Old men walk to, up to his house just to sit around listening to him spin his yarns. So even though I can't name it, have little understanding of it, and don't know what will come of it, I have pre precedence for what I'm about to do. And then he launches into his story, which is hilarious, but we don't have time for that. So thinking about punctuation and time, I want you to, I'm gonna pull this apart a little more. So he starts out the first paragraph, this is sixth grade, period. So just kind of a, here we are. And then he sets, tells more about the, the setting. And we hopefully by um, stating up front, you know, he's a sixth grader, we can also pull ourselves back into those sixth grade dimly lit hallway places and the bigger kids, right? We, so we get a sense of the setting, right? And the, and the characters pretty quickly. But then the second sentence is, is just incredible. And the first two sentences I'm gonna reread. Okay, I'm 11 years old, very hormonal, both smart and ignorant, full of myself, crazy for attention and admiration, period. It's 1953. So what, what's going on there? We have, okay, comma, I'm 11 years old, comma, very hormonal, comma, both smart and ignorant, comma, fool of myself, comma, crazy for attention and admiration, period. It's 1953, period. What's he doing there? What's he doing with time? What did you hear in how I read it? Hopefully, I read it well enough that you got a sense of the urgency and you know, think about the breath, the rush of that sentence. Okay, I'm 11 years old, very hormonal, both smart and ignorant, full of myself, crazy for attention and admiration, right? That's this, this, I mean, that's an 11 year old right there. Those hormones are kicking. He doesn't know what quite to do with himself, and yet he knows he's got this gift and he's talented in a certain way, but yet, and he's seen his grandfather do these things. And yet he doesn't really know what it's called and what he what he can do. And he also has these big boys leering over him, threatening, right? If he doesn't get it right, he might get a little beat up. So the use of commas there, I think, gives you a sense of the content and the force of breath that you the power of breath and, and the control of it that you have as a writer. And then the second sentence, it's 1953, period. So the use of sentence lengths, <clears throat> as well as, um, yeah, sentence length and variety is also another very important tool that combines with punctuation to manipulate breath. So we have that first long, powerful sentence about being an 11 year old hormonal kid. It's almost, but it's not, it's almost a run on, but it's not, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the second short sentence, it's 1953. So that, you know, the content of that second sentence goes back to the setting. It sets up where we are, um, what, you know, we probably, most of us weren't alive in 1953, but we get a sense of, Okay, you know, TV is new. Um, there are certain cultural norms that we uh, hopefully know or have learned <clears throat> that we can relate to. But also that short sentence does what? It gives us a pause. Like a good drink of water. So the contrast and the of lengths gives us a, a way, in addition to the punctuation, gives us a way to manipulate the reader <clears throat> and the sense of time. So just to go over some other uh, ways, very briefly, you know, we don't have time to do a lot, um, that writers manipulate time, um, paragraph lengths, well, no, you back to sentences. Um, so, so the extreme example of those, that first long sentence and that second 
short sentence would be run-ons, <clears throat> right? And, and you know, you've probably been taught what run-ons are and how to avoid them. I and mean, their sentences go on and on and on. But you can, you can use those for effect. Um, the same with fragments, right? Short, choppy sentences. Um, both of those are, in my, my view, are kind of like swear words in writing. You don't want to overuse them unless your character you know, is foul mouth, uh, trench mouth. Um, but normally, you, know, you, you save those little special tools like fragments, run ons, and swear words uh, for special occasions, for, for emphasis. And so think about you know, where best that would be in your work. Uh, the same with paragraph. Paragraph lengths, paragraph breaks are a good way to, to think about breath as well as content, to think about you know, um, how long do I want to go to mirror the content of what's going on, but also before I give the reader a break, and kind of this kind of a pause um, before the next content as well as big sense of, you know, there's many smaller breaths within a paragraph, but the kind of a larger breath with each paragraph break. And again, that's the fragments and, and run-ons are a good metaphor there. You know, you can have very long paragraphs that go on and on and on forever, or very short one-line paragraphs that kind of give a sense of choppiness. So um, if you have a, uh, a, a high intensity scene of somebody running, um, and actually there's, there's no cut and dried answer for that. Sometimes the run-on is the best for some high intensity uh, scene, or sometimes the opposite. Sometimes the fragment, you know, you, <laughs> You're trying to breathe, right? You're running, so you want the reader to be breathing as as your characters run. So those are again, there's no set rule there, but play. That's that's kind of the ultimate. The lesson I want you to have here is um, think about language, think about how you can play, think about writing as play. And one of your greatest play balls, uh, one of your greatest toys, is words and how you manipulate them with punctuation. Um, just a couple of smaller other ways of thinking about time, uh, even, even smaller than, than periods and commas is the, the length of your words. Longer words take longer time. They're often a little more complex. Um, and that might be good for what your, your, you know, your content or your characters versus short words quicker shorter breaths. Uh, the use of repetition like lists um, is, is also a, a way to build um, time, to, to build intensity. And um, the use of verb tense is, is a way to think about time, going back and forth between times, uh, often marked by um, different tenses. Again, that can be tricky. You need to know what you're doing with tenses. But um, so those are, those are a bunch of, uh, of hopefully gifts uh, or hopefully uh, ways for you to think about your own writing as well as getting your reader so absorbed, so absorbed into your work that they miss their train stop and you are still sitting there watching them read, fascinated and happy to be uh, part of that. that escape that great moment in literary history, you riding the train, riding your book while the reader reads. So thank you for that. And um, I'll start my reading here in a moment. All right, so for this reading, I'm gonna, uh, I've chosen an essay that I think is timely. Uh, it's hunting season and I do hunt and um, this is about that. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it first appeared in the magazine called Oxford American, Oxford American. And that was in, I think, 2014. And it should be available online. So if, if you want to read this again, like uh, the David Huddle story, I, I strongly encourage you to 
find that story. It's a, a, I love that story. It's, it's funny. It's really funny and powerful. Um, and it, that was in brevity. As Oxford American. Both are very fine literary journals. Um, so this one is called Drowning Deer. And it has uh, different sections. I'll pause in between sections. And uh, it's not easy to read. And so I, I assume it's not going to be too easy to listen to in terms of some of the content. But uh, I think, I hope you find it powerful and um, enlightening. Drowning deer. Deer snorts. Dog snarls. That's all I hear. Then I see brown and white fur, clumps of it floating in water, the stream pinking with blood. Deer and dogs and water, my dogs. Jake, 90 pounds of shepherd, taking the does, hooves and teeth. Becca and little bee, smaller but still good sized dogs at the rear, biting fur and flesh, getting kicked, holding on. Yesterday in the stand, I waited until the herd moved close to graze under my tree. Do it, I thought, trying to calm my breath. Still early, all day to work them up. Boom, first one down and dead, heart a holy mess. <clears throat> work the lever, boom. Second one shot in the chest, down after a long leap. Three deer in a day and freezer full for the year, greedy bastard, boom. But the third deer stumbled and I saw her leg, the blood, the miss. Trailed her for 40 yards into rhododendron where spore disappeared, signs no longer signing. Bright drops of blood gone to the dull rust of oak leaf. I searched for two hours, back and forth through woods, back and forth through meadow, and found nothing. So I gave up to work up the two I got. The next day, back in the woods, I hunted for a trail, gritted out thickets, crawled the hills. When I heard the dogs a quarter mile away, I ran with my gun. She bedded by the stream. I should have known. Deer go to water when they're sick. Jake had sent her to this tangle of greenery, Joe Pye and ironweed, sweet grass and jewel. I waded through tall plants toward the clamor, toward doe and dogs, their splashing fight. My gun was useless with the dog so close. I dropped it on the bank and leapt onto the doe. I try, <clears throat> I try to kill three to five deer here, here on our Virginia farm. I do so to protect our woods and feed our dogs, but I am a deer hunter who doesn't eat venison anymore. I like a good burger and my mouth waters when I think about a dip of mint chocolate ice cream. Yet I prefer a plant-based diet because I don't want to drown my body in fat and excess protein. So my wife and I give a, gave up eating any deer and our dogs eat all we can give. The dogs are mutts, the dogs are family, the dogs are carnivores. For several years, we fed them a diet of meat, bones, and what we call their veggie smoothie. We want to replicate what they would eat in the wild, what their cousins, the wolves and coyotes eat. So all of it is uncooked. The bones are only what they can chomp without injury. And the slurry of veggies imitates the stomach contents of a dead animal. The dogs love their chow, especially venison. I grew up in a house my school teacher parents built in Newburgh, Pennsylvania, a town in Cumberland County with a population of 300. Out our picture window, a quarter mile to the west, we could see my grandparents and uncle's dairy farm, a farm where <clears throat> the place of my father's birth. My friend Andy lived in the opposite direction, about a mile to the east on the other side of Newburgh. When we were in our early teens, Andy's father built a huge chicken house on their farm for egg production. The structure was longer than a football field, and it sat on a hill overlooking town. From a distance, it looked like Noah's Ark had come to rest right there by the Reels cornfield, except this Ark held 60,000 chickens, and these birds would never stride down a plank to scratch and bathe in dirt. Andy and I both wrestled on the school team, and to lose weight some evenings, we'd race each other around the chicken house. The pole lights cast a yellow glare over the building's white sidings and stubble of winter killed weeds. I could hear the soft murmur of the birds inside and the purr of the massive fans that cooled them even in the darkest, coldest months. Whenever we'd turn the last corner to run the length of the downwind side, I'd hesitate. The stink was so strong, I could hardly breathe. Andy just bolted ahead and I tried to catch up. 
One spring, Andy asked if I wanted to help change out the chickens. He promised good money and said lots of Amish girls were also getting hired. I showed up early on a Saturday to find semi-trailers waiting at one end of the chicken house and people gathering at the other. I joined the crowd as we filed through the egg sorting room then through another doorway and into the massive cavern of birds. Andy had to shout over the din to tell me what to do. He ended with, just don't breathe through your nose and you'll get used to it. The house had no windows, just strings of bare light bulbs down each aisle. We walked on narrow planks that bounced under our weight and below us was a pit filled with a year's worth of chicken shit, 10 feet deep. Don't fall, Andy yelled, smiling as he pointed to the narrow gap between the walkway and the cages which ran the length of the house. Each row was staggered above and behind the next in a pyramid form so that the birds on the bottom wouldn't get shat on by the ones above. Two narrow conveyor belts ran beside each row, one carrying food and the other carrying eggs. The wire cages measured three feet by three feet and each held nine white chickens. Our job, open a cage, grab legs from nine birds and yank them out. Don't think and do it quick. Walk fast to the end of the house and hand the load to someone else to stuff them into the crates and then slide the crates into semi trucks. Within, few, within minutes, feathers fill the air and my hands ached from pinching the live weight. Don't worry if you break a leg, the guy beside me advised. They're just going to the factory. This time tomorrow, there'll be soup. The birds tried to scramble to the back of their cage. Some were bloody and featherless from being pecked. Others couldn't move because their claws had grown around the wire floor. I felt their bones break as I pulled them free. During the days that followed, a cloud of stench hung over the whole town as Andy's father and hired help cleaned out the pit. They spread the manure over all of the surrounding fields and feathers sometimes floated down on the main street a mile away. A week after the workers disinfected the chicken house, we all returned to put new birds into the now clean cages. This time, the whole process ran in reverse. A bearded Amish man handed me nine birds by their legs and like everyone else, I scurried down the long aisles to where someone waited to stuff them into the empty cage where they'd have a year to survive. This time we tried not to break any legs. Through most of my childhood, I worked on my grandparents' and uncle's dairy farm. When I turned 16 and could drive, I went to work for a larger dairy where instead of milking 20 cows, we had 75. And instead of twice a day, we milked every eight hours, three times a day. The milking parlor consisted of a cement pit with elevated stalls on either side for the cows. We worked in that pit where the air smelled like bleach and we stood at eye level to the 10 sagging udders. We'd clean their teats, slap on the milkers and move to the opposite side to repeat. Five minutes later, the suction valves would make a wheezing sound because the bags were empty. Then we'd remove the milkers, open the gates, start in on the next batch. We never really saw the cow's eyes, never scratched their heads like my uncle did. The cows would often shit right there in the parlor, splattering the equipment and us. My boss used to play college basketball at a small ag school, which meant he was quick and strong and towered over everybody. He also had a temper. After hours of getting shat on while looking at nothing but hooves and bags, he usually got cranky. Once a cow wouldn't move out of her stall, preventing the three behind her from moving on, the whole operation stopped except the empty click click of the milking machine. My boss picked up a two by four and he started hitting the cow's legs as hard as he could, swearing that he'd sell her to the slaughterhouse tomorrow if she didn't move. He broke that board on her before she finally limped away. I drowned another deer. This one during winter, the snow a foot deep and hard crusted that way for months. That time too, Jake was ahead on the trail out of sight. He gave his long, low growling bark warning that he'd come upon something big. I slogged through the snow to find a spike buck cornered in what we called Wishbone Holler. I shouted and waved to run him off, but then, then I saw the mangled dangling hoof and shattered slender bone. Some other greedy bastard shot too low, lost the blood trail, or didn't even try. So the buck stood on three feet, lowered his head, wanted to gouge Jake. I moved to save the dog and drive the buck uphill into cover of thick woods, but he charged me instead. 
He stumbled and Jake lunged for his throat. The spike bug twisted its neck and tried to drive Jake into the ground. We each retreated, waited, panting. The spike buck faltered. He'd already lasted too long with no grass, no way to paw through deep snow, no way to stop the blood. And this now, I thought, but my gun was a mile away. I circled behind Jake to push the buck the other way, downhill, where he'd have to cross the stream, a 10 foot leap, easy for a healthy deer. If he made that, he'd have to jump a fence uphill. He charged out of the mouth of Wishbone, out of sight. Jake followed, closing in. I knew from his bark that the buck didn't make it across the stream. I ran to find Jake at his head, the buck still fighting. From the bank, I leapt onto his back. The cold water stunned me and the shallowness too, the ice cutting my shin. This deer was all ribs. I felt the frame of him between my legs. I avoided the slender antlers and pushed down on his neck, leaned my whole body and held. His kick slowed. He breathed in cold water, then he didn't exhale. Later, while butchering, I found something I'd never seen in 30 years of hunting. A deer so lean, it had no fat. I hunted as a kid, pop cans and starlings with a BB gun, groundhogs with grandpa's 22, pheasants and rabbits with a 20 gauge shotgun dad brought, bought for me one Christmas. I hunted deer too with grandpa's antique 3040 Craig, but I never shot any. Once I sat beside a deer path on Blue Mountain in the bitter cold of winter, I fell asleep and woke to the sound of a doe swishing less than a foot beside me. We turned to look at each other before she snorted and ran away. Those Pennsylvania woods I loved as a kid now have too few tree seedlings and wildflowers because of too many deer. On a recent visit home, I drove up into the mountains to find that much of the forest looked like a savanna. The understory opened with long views deep into the trees. Instead of a dense undergrowth of flowers and young hardwoods, hay-scented ferns carpeted the ground, one of the few plants deer don't eat. But on one track, the state had constructed a fence to keep the deer out. There, the forest floor was thick with all sorts of saplings and wildflowers. Scientists have extensively documented what a population of 15 million deer does to our country's landscape. One study published in the Journal of Tory Botanical Society analyzed the plant life in a forest where deer had been excluded for 60 years. When the researchers compared this plot to adjacent woods where deer roamed freely, they found that, quote, long-term browsing, over-browsing, decreased the cover of forbs by more than 99% and eliminated shrubs. They also discovered that excluding deer increased the total plant cover sevenfold and concluded that deer have dramatically changed the composition of a forest, converting what was once a species rich and lush understory of forbs and shrubs into a depauperate understory dominated by a few ferns, grasses, and browse resistant trees. It may take many, many decades for deer to ever recover. Put another way, we are drowning in deer. Pennsylvania spends approximately $3 million each year on temporary deer fencing to allow tree regeneration on state forest lands, according to a 2009 publication from the state's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. The national scope of this problem is staggering. A publication from Cornell argues that, quote, annual estimates of deer damage are reported to exceed $2 billion nationwide, including 1 billion in car damages, more than 100 million in agricultural crop damages, 750 million in damage to the timber industry and more than 250 million in damage to metropolitan households, end quote. Yeah, this report came out in 2001 and these figures obviously have risen since then. An estimate from State Farm Insurance claims that in 2012, the cost of deer collisions, deer car collisions alone exceeded 4 billion. That translates into approximately 100,000 deer vehicle accidents per month in the U.S. And the insurer, Insurance Institute of Highway Safety states these collisions cause about 200 fatilities each year. 200 fatilities. These figures become personal not long ago. My wife, Sarah, was on her way to work when a huge brook ran into the side of her car, tore off the mirror, and rolled across the hood in a windshield for a second. Sarah's sky turned furry and brown. Then the bucks landed on the opposite side of the road. 
there it rised, alive, but with a broken spine. After she stopped, she flagged down two men and asked if they had a gun. They, shot, they thought she was crazy until they saw the deer floundering in the ditch. A woman living nearby came running with a rifle. I saw the whole thing, she said, heard it too, thought you might need this. The men took care of the buck while Sarah headed on to a classroom of first graders. Not all deer car collisions end so well for the people in the vehicle, and rarely do the deer survive. Some days on my long commute, I'll count three carcasses along a 50 mile stretch of highway. Some, day, some days, all that's left is a huge red smear. The doe I shot and rode, the fierce doe I needed to drown, did not want to die. She was fat and even with three dogs at her and me on her shoulders, she shift, shifted enough so that I lost my footing and suddenly eyes at her level, I too breathed water heard it in my ears. I gripped her neck, righted myself to stand and push her head under again, watched her breathe in, imagined her lungs swelling, her throat burning, white where she once saw trees, that buzzing nothingness, that electric snowing buzz I experienced as a child in a public pool, my mother behind the fence, she too unable to swim, watching, knowing the water was filling my ears, my nose, my mouth. Deer know how to swim though. Once by the Potomac, I watched a buck on the far shore, his tines a candelabra of sun. He dipped to drink, sniffed the wind before plunging in. He swam fast across the quarter mile expanse of the river, head up, reflection on the calm surface, feet plowing currents. He made it ashore downstream out of sight. I imagined him shaking once and moving on, rut on his mind. Overhead, the interstate bridge carried the boom and rattle of traffic. Again, I shoved down on the doe, her matted fur between my fingers, her weight a little less than mine. Die, die now, please die, I thought. The dogs had stopped barking. They snarled instead, ripped and yanked, the water turning red. Die now, please. The kicking stopped. She gulped one last time, then she went slack. Enough, I yelled at the dogs, my voice hoarse, throat raw. They stood back, panted and watched me, hands on knees, panting too. I dragged the doe to the stream's edge and sat, holding her slender hooves, trying to catch my breath, but I couldn't pull her up the three feet of bank. Her wet hooves kept slipping out of my hands. Twice I had to jump back in to regrip. Finally, I just kneeled in the water to hug her body and heave it onto land. The dogs growled and I had to wrap little bee's nose for her to loose her hold on the doe's flank. They crouched nearby, waiting for me to turn. I grabbed Jake's collar <clears throat> and started to run, calling the others. They actually followed, looking back as we jogged the hill to the truck and knives in a long evening of cutting meat. When I sliced her open, I found her lungs exploded, her chest full of blood and water. Thank you very much. And take care. <laughs>